All right, good morning, everybody. Can you guys hear me? All right, hoping so. <laughs> I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me and hopefully you can also see the screen. Uh, <laughs> just a little confirmation in the chat, please, if you don't mind. I don't wanna go off on and on. <laughs> All right, perfect, perfect. You can see, you can hear. All right, so welcome to the last lecture. Sounds pretty sad, but uh, I, I don't know. I think we've had a good semester so far. <laughs> At least that's what I think. You may be thinking something completely different. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to have a little bit of fun. We are going to play around with the finite element software. Now, finite element software is great because anything that you can imagine, you can basically simulate. As we see uh, in Abacus here, there is a lot of different options, uh, which basically means we can simulate anything we want to. Now, when it comes to simulation, there is definitely a right and a wrong way of simulating things. And when we go through this today, we're going to talk about uh, kind of what each function means, but also things that you should be aware of when you actually do your own modeling. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Before we begin, does anybody have any questions or concerns with the course, the final, anything like that? Or are we feeling pretty good going into this last lecture? I'm hoping that you're all feeling good because it's going to be a nice, fun lecture. Uh, the actual simulation part is, is the best. The whole goal of this course was to introduce you to concepts that uh, simulation software such as Abacus actually does in the background. That's the nice part is you don't have to do any math anymore. You just have to simulate it. And since you are now experts at basically continuum mechanics, you can simulate anything you want. <laughs> so if you have any questions, just throw it up in the chat. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. But we are going to get started. So today we are going to have fun and we are going to simulate a cantilever beam. Now, I thought I would just kind of leave it more open-ended and uh, get a lot of your input from this. So I'm curious with a lot of things. Uh, in our cantilever beam, do you guys want to add some cool features like a hole, anything like that, or should we just leave it as a solid cantilever beam? What do you guys think? We are going to do this together. We are going to have some fun together. <laughs> so it's really up to you guys what you want to simulate. And if there's no answer, as complicated as it can get. Well, <laughs> that might be uh, a bit too long, but we'll include the hole then. So in Abacus, basically, when you want to model something, the first thing that you do, and this is going to sound trivial, is you're going to want to actually save your model. So, of course, file, save as. It's off screen right now, so you can have it anywhere. And I'll just put it as Abacus Fun, something like this. So saving the model isn't too hard, but here's one thing that you should definitely be aware of is also after you save your model, you should also go down to set work directory. Basically what the model is, is all of the inputs that you're going to need for your model, what this screen is basically going to be. After you have all your inputs and you run an analysis, Abacus or any other finite element program, they're going to create a bunch of additional files. Now those additional files will be stored somewhere in your computer and they can be a little bit hard to track down. So what you want to do is you want to go set work directory and this will basically show you where all of these analysis files are going to be stored. So you can pick wherever you want. I'll just leave it here for now. But it's a very important because all of your results will be in these files. So if you forget where you store them, <laughs> you're not going to be able to see your results. So that's going to be the first thing. Now, when it comes to Abacus, it's actually pretty nice because the main thing you want to do when you're creating a model, and it doesn't matter which one it is, is you're going to go to this module tab right here. So if I were to expand it, as we can see, we have a bunch of different things. Now, when you create a model, I recommend just going down this module tab and going from section to section to section to section. And by the end, you'll get to this thing right here, which is job. And job here is actually when you submit the analysis. So in the first part, property, this is when we actually create kind of the geometry of our model. 
The second part property, this is when we assign it material properties such as steel or concrete, whatever. And then the assembly tab is where we take all of our parts and our model and we combine it together to create kind of the model as a whole. And the best way I like to think about it is the part uh, section right here. This is where we would create basically the Lego pieces to a set. And then in the assembly tab, that's when we take all those pieces that we created and we put them together to form the whole model. After that, the step, interaction, load, and mesh. This is getting more into the actual, what kind of analysis do we want to do? Uh, what kind of formulations do you want to do? All that fun stuff. So we're gonna start off in the parts tab. And as we're going to see, every time you change modules, all of the buttons are on the side of the screen are going to change. So if we go to the parts tab, these are going to be the buttons. And in order to create a new part, you want to go to this first button here. And if you just hover over it, it actually says create part, which is pretty nice. So if we were to click it, you're going to get this screen right here. So if you're having a model with a bunch of different parts, you're going to want to name them specific things uh, so you don't get them mixed up. I'm just going to call this one a beam. Now, as we can see, the first option is going to be the modeling space. So there's three different options. There's basically 3D, 2D, and then axis symmetric. Now, axis symmetric is something we never really talked about. It's used a lot in uh, pipes or tubes, stuff like that. Basically, when you have a hollow radius is when you want to use axis symmetric. Uh, for our, our beam here, we are going to leave it as two dimensions. So we are just going to select 2D planar. And then basically you're given a bunch of options. So the type, first of all, is going to be deformable or rigid. Now the two different types of rigid depend on the scenario, but we know that we want our beam to actually be deformable. So we are going to keep it as deformable. And then the last part right here is, do you want it to be a, a shell, a wire, or basically a point. Well, a shell is actually what we want. Those solid elements that we talked about, or we talked about yesterday, as well as all of the, uh, when you Google finite element method and you see all those colorful pictures, <laughs> those are all actually shell elements, or not shell elements, but shell features. So we are going to keep it kind of as the default here. Now, when you do this, well, actually the last part is approximate size. This doesn't matter. So it sounds like it actually matters, but this doesn't matter. And I will show you what this means right here. So we're going to go continue. And basically you're giving or given a drawing tab. Now, if we were to look at the side here, it's kind of like uh, AutoCAD or something like that, where basically this is where we can start creating the geometry of our model. Uh, the first thing is, is that approximate size thing. If I were to zoom out, as we can see, at some point the grid ends. So the approximate size that I just uh, mentioned, it's basically going to be the size of your grid lines. But it doesn't actually matter because if I wanted to, I could create a shape outside of the grid lines. It's going to be completely fine to do that. So even though it, uh, it sounds important, it's actually not that important. So yeah, I just want to exit. A lot of the features are actually not shown uh, because I zoomed in so much for you guys. <laughs> so you won't really see them. So in this tab right here, I want to basically create our beam. Now our beam itself, we can have it as rectangular. We can have it as kind of varying throughout the cross section. What uh, we are going to do though, is we are going to keep it rectangular and we are going to add a hole to it. So what I did is I went to this one right here, basically create a rectangle. And from this, all I have to do is specify the bottom left corner and the bottom right corner. So at the bottom here, it says pick a starting corner for the rectangle. I just like to go 0, 0, something like this. And then I can specify the other corner. Now, the thing to keep in mind, and we've kind of talked about this a lot in Mathematica, is that units matter. So if we were to look at the bottom, though, although we're defining geometry, it doesn't say meters, it doesn't say millimeters, anything like that. But we are going to use the same sign convention, or not sign convention, unit convention that we used before. So if I were to have everything in millimeters, it means I want everything else in newtons and MPA. If I wanted things in meters, then I need everything in KPA and kilonewtons, stuff like that. So personally, as you know, I like to prefer uh, millimeters, newtons, and MPA. I find it to be 
probably the best. So for our beam here, let's say that it's going to be one meter long and I don't know, let's say 300 millimeters high. So we know in the x direction it's one meter or a thousand millimeters. So I put a thousand and then comma 300 millimeters high. So I'm going to go 300. So as we can see, this approximate size that we had is 200 was just this grid. But if we were to zoom out, we can see our beam now kind of as a whole. Now what's nice is we can actually define a circle inside of that beam. So right now we have the beam, but we can actually define that hole in the center of the beam using this create circle one. So it's basically just using a combination of simple shapes. If you want to, you can create a bunch of connected lines using the top function here. It's really up to you what you want to do. So I'm going to create a circle and let's put the circle kind of right at the mid span of our beam. So we know that in the horizontal direction, the mid span is 500 and in the vertical direction, it's going to be 150. So I'm going to go 500 comma 150. So that picks our center point. And then we can basically pick how high or how large we want this circle. So let's just put it as, I don't know, right here, looking pretty good. And this will be our beam. So it doesn't look like it's anything too special, but when I exit out here, so once you're done creating all of the geometry for your beam, you just have to click on the red X, cancel procedure. It says sketch the section for the planar shell. We've already done that, so we can just go done. And as we can see, we now have a part. So this is going to be one of the parts of our model. Uh, it's <laughs> For this particular scenario, it's going to be the only part of our model, but this is how we create parts. Now, if you look at the very left-hand side, we have something called the model tree. And under parts now, if I were to expand it, we now have our beam right here. So if we had uh, additional parts, they would all kind of come under this parts tab right here. So the first thing to kind of note when you're creating parts is that all we're doing is creating the geometry. We're not creating any sort of finite element formulations. We're not doing anything like that. We're just creating geometry. Uh, this is essentially just AutoCAD. It, it's not doing any sort of simulation or anything like that. So after we are done creating our parts, again, all you want to do is follow this module tab. So we're saying, okay, we have our beam already defined. The next thing that we can do is define the properties of our beam. So as we can see, when we go to the property tab, everything has now changed. And there's going to be a couple of different things you're going to want to do. The number one thing, or the first thing, is under this stress strain curve looking button, it's basically how we create a material. So that's going to be the first thing is you want to create a material with specified material properties. So we are going to say that our beam is made out of steel. So I'm just going to put steel, something like this in the name. And then under here, we have actually a bunch of tabs. They look like buttons, but they're actually tabs. So in the general tab, we have things like density, uh, other things that you don't really want to be playing with. But density would be something that you would want to define if you were doing a dynamic analysis because, of course, it's all dependent on the mass. Uh, we're not doing that, so I can just delete it. In the mechanical tab, this is what you're mainly going to be interested in because you have elasticity and plasticity. These are going to be the two big ones that you want. Uh, the other ones are very nice, but chances are you won't be using them too much. So if we were to go to elasticity, we're given a bunch of different options. And these are basically just different material models. So we already know elastic behavior. So if I were to go elasticity and then elastic, as we can see, it gives us kind of the definition or our elasticity definition. And we can select the different types. So we can have isotropic, which we talked about in class. We have orthotropic, which again, we talked about. And isotropic, all those fun things. So it's just, what we talked about in class. This is why it starts to get fun to simulate things because you now know what all these different names mean. So we're gonna go uh, to the simplest form which is isotropic. And down here is where you input basically the two variables needed to define the model. So the first one is the Young's modulus and the second one is the Poisson's ratio. So question for you guys in the chat, if I am doing steel what should my Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio approximately be? Let's see what you guys think.
What do you think? What would be a reasonable reasonable value for Young's modulus for a steel? All right, yeah, Ryan, completely correct. So we have it in terms of MPA, and we know that the elastic modulus of steel is around 200,000, so 200, 1, 2, 3, and our Poisson's ratio is about 2, 0.3. The nice thing in Abacus, remember in Mathematica, I always said it's best to define everything in fractions. Uh, Abacus doesn't care at all, <laughs> so you can define it however you want, so we can just go 0.3. Now, this is just going to be elastic behavior. So question for you guys in the chat, do you think that this would include yielding or anything like that? Have I defined yielding or no? Not really. No? A little bit shy today? That's okay. But thank you, Ryan. We have not, not defined any yielding. So as we know, elastic materials is basically just a linear line going all the way up. Now, steel typically yields, <laughs> as you guys know. So if we were looking at steel rebar, it usually yields at 400 MPA. If we're looking at steel as an actual beam, it usually yields at around 350 MPA. Now, in order to define that, what we actually do is we go to the mechanical tab, and we know that yielding is a form of plasticity, right? It's a form of plasticity. Now we didn't really talk about plasticity, but you guys know that it is a form of plasticity. And if we go to the plasticity tab, we have a bunch of different options. We have concrete smeared cracking, concrete damaged plasticity, clay plasticity, a lot of different material options. And you're going to see that the more uh, complex your material, the more parameters you're going to need to input. For steel though, it's actually very nice because the behavior of steel in tension is the same as the behavior of steel in compression. Now, if that's the case, we actually don't really need a fancy model. We can just use the simple plasticity model. So we have an elastic branch, and then we have a plastic branch. Now, right here is where we can define the complete behavior of steel. Because as we can see in the corner here, it says one. So basically what we would do in the plasticity branch here it's just to find a bunch of points on our stress strain curve. And what Abacus will do is it's going to take those points and it's going to assume a linear relationship between the two. So as we know, our steel kind of goes up and then it yields. So if I just want to have perfect yielding, all I would have to do is specify this point after it yields and then Abacus will kind of take the rest. If I want to specify yielding and then a little bit of strain hardening, well, then I would add an additional point. So the first or the first uh, thing to be aware of, though, is if we were to look here, we have stress, but over here we have plastic strain. All right, plastic strain. So these uh, this function here is going to be the non-recoverable strain components, and it's very easy to determine. So this will just be the actual stress on our stress strain curve. So let's say that it yields at 350 MPa. I can go 350. And the plastic strain at this point is actually going to be zero. Now, this is where it starts to get confusing for a lot of students. They say, well, shouldn't be some other strain. Again, this is going to be the plastic strain. And I'll put it in the Zoom chat here. The plastic strain is going to be equal to our elastic modulus minus sigma divided by strain. So I just, oh, I sent it as a direct message. Hold on. <laughs> everyone in the meeting. So this is actually what's going to be our plastic string. We have our Young's modulus minus, actually no, that's, that's wrong. It should be sigma minus e divided by string. <laughs> Something like this. So basically all we're doing is we're taking sigma and we're dividing it by our elastic modulus divided by strain. And if you were to do that for an elastic material and use 200,000 and divide it by the yield strain, well, you're going to find it actually goes back to zero. Because basically plastic strain is going to be those non-recoverable strain components. But we know if something is elastic and we load it and then unload it, all that strain is recoverable. And that's why it's zero over here. So we are going to leave it. Uh, we're not going to go uh, too in depth into plasticity. All you need to know is that now that we've defined this yield stress of 350, it's going to go up to 350 and then it's going to plateau. 
If I wanted to, to find some strain hardening, I would go, let's say, 450 and 0 0.01, something like that. But of course, we are not going to do this uh, in this model. So we just defined a yield stress of 350. That's going to be it. So if we look at our steel uh, material, we have elasticity covered, we have plasticity covered. If I were to go OK, if we look on the left, we now have our steel material model, which is great. Right? We have our material defined, but here is the one thing. I defined my material, but it is not defined in my beam yet. And the reason why is because, as we said in the parts tab, we can actually create many, many different parts. And chances are, if you have a model with a bunch of different parts, they are still going to have the same material behavior. So what Abacus does is it allows you to create a material, which we just did, and then we can assign it to whatever part we want. So all we did is we defined a material, but we didn't actually assign it to our beam. To do that, we actually need to do two steps. The first step right here is we have to assign a section to our beam. All right, that's gonna be the first step, assign a section. And the reason why is this. If we look at our beam, we've defined the geometry in this plane, but we actually didn't define the thickness of this beam into the page. As we know, if we have a thicker beam into the page, things are going to start to change. So what we do is we go assign section, and then it says select the region to be assigned a section. So I'm going to select our beam right here. Uh, enter. Oh. The thing about having three monitors is some of the tabs appear in really weird spots, and then i got to find out where the, where the heck they are. <laughs> uh, where are you? All right, hold on. We are just going to create a section. Okay, there it is. So we are going to create a section. We'll call this our beam section right here. And we have a bunch of different types. So the one that you are going to use the most is going to be solid and homogeneous. As we discussed in the lecture yesterday, uh, the formulations that we did are actually for these solid uh, elements. We have beam elements right here. So if you wanted to create a beam or a truss, uh, like something you would do in Civi uh, 372, uh, you would do it through these two elements. Uh, shell elements get a little bit more complex. They're basically solid elements, but they have that rotational degree of freedom. Or So basically they can handle moments. So we're not going to go into that. We are going to stick with solid and homogeneous, and we named it beam. We're going to go continue. And then it's going to say, okay, what is the material of this section? Well, we only have the one defined. If we had different materials defined, we would have a big drop down list, but we only have the steel. And then this button right here is basically asking, what is the thickness of this section into the page? So we're going to click, uh, we are going to check it. And let's say that the thickness of our beam into the page was 200 millimeters. So this is where we would actually input that 200, if that makes sense to you guys. So if we go OK, we now have a section defined. Now, if I were to go to this side, we still haven't actually assigned that section into the beam. That's why I said it's actually two steps. First of all, you have to create the beam section, and then we apply it to the beam. And we do that using this assign section button. We are going to click the beam. We are going to go done. And as we can see, we now have our section, which we have beam. It's our only one defined, and we go OK. The trick, or the nice thing to Abacus is, is if you uh, correctly define things, it'll change the color of things. So notice how our part now is this green color. This means that we have now t uh, taken material properties and actually defined it into our beam. So this uh, beam now has both a thickness into the page, and it also has uh, uh, material properties, which is great. So this is going to be the entirety of the property tab. Is there any questions so far? Hopefully you guys are following along. <laughs> Not too bad. Again, if you guys have questions, just throw it into the chat. So after we're done with the property tab, we go down to the assembly tab. So notice that it's blank right now. Now in Abacus, this right here is actually what's going to be analyzed. This is just kind of, if I were to go back to parts, all these parts that we created, they're kind of stored in a library. They're not actually used in an analysis. What's going to be used in the actual analysis is going to be everything on this assembly tab. 
So notice that right now we don't have anything at all. So what we need to do is we need to take the parts that we created, bring them into this tab, and then we can start assembling things. And by assembling things, I mean typically we have more than one part in our model, but since we have only the one part, it's, it's going to be pretty self-explanatory. So to bring parts in, we go to this button up here, create instance. So if I were to click that, what it's going to do, oops, I didn't want to do that, is it's basically going to have an entire list of all the parts we created. Now we only have the one part, so it's just going to be selected by default, and we are just going to go OK. If we wanted to, let's say that we had two beams, we can actually uh, auto offset them. And what you'll see is we can apply one. And then if I were to click it again, we can start having multiple beams in our modeling tab, which is pretty fun, right? At least you would think so. <laughs> so we are just going to keep the, the one. And this is the beam that we are going to analyze. So now Abacus is treating this as what we are going to analyze. The thing is, is we haven't defined any sort of loading. We haven't defined any boundary conditions and we haven't defined the actual element mesh. Remember I said yesterday is that we split this geometry into a bunch of little elements. We haven't done that yet. So in the assembly tab, this is where you would create our, your entire model basically. But since we only have one part, our model is just going to be that one part. If we have time at the end of the lecture, maybe we will play around with that and see how it goes. So assembly, good to go. The next one is going to be step. Now step is where we define our loading protocol. And what I mean by that is typically what happens is loads are applied in stages. You don't just have all the loads acting at one time. So for instance, what I would do, or an example of this would be, if I want to subject my beam to an, uh, a self-weight load, and then after the self-weight is applied, then subject it to a vertical load, well then these would be my actual steps. So that's what we do in this step command is we define when loads are going to be applied. Uh, for this cantilever beam, let's say we fix it at the left hand side and let's say that we are just going to apply uh, a pressure throughout the top. So if we're just applying a pressure, we are only going to have that one step. So what we are going to do is we are going to go here, create step and it appeared off screen, but you'll get this menu right here. So the name of the step, we would say something at like apply pressure to the beam. So again, this is going to be the sequence of loading that you apply to the model. Uh, we are going to have this after our initial step. And as we can see, we have a bunch of different options. So if you wanted to run a dynamic analysis, this is when you would select dynamic. It either has to be implicit or explicit, uh, different ways of doing it. But we are going to do a static analysis. So we are going to go static general. So this is the most basic bare bones type of analysis you can get is going to be this static general case. So we're going to go continue and then we are going to get this menu. Now this menu has a lot of different things. Uh, we are doing almost a linear analysis. We have a little bit of yielding defined, but it's not too bad. Uh, in this step, what you're basically going to do is define a couple things. The first one right here is going to be this NLGEOM. This basically stands for nonlinear geometry. So as we know, uh, if you've taken any design courses, we have something called second order effects, where if I have a straight column and I have an axial load applied, well, that axial load is not going to create any moment. But we know that as our column starts to deform laterally, at some point that axial load will be offset and it will create a moment. So this NLGeom, nonlinear geometry, this would actually account for things like that. So we typically select it as on. Uh, there's not too many scenarios where you would keep it off. In a linear analysis, it actually doesn't make too big of a difference. But for the majority of cases, you're going to want to keep this on. The other one is going to be the time period. But since we're doing a static analysis, this also doesn't matter too much. You can have it as whatever you want. But what you do want to pay attention to is going to be this incrementation. So typically what happens is we have nonlinear analysis. And I kind of mentioned it yesterday in class with that newton raphson method is that if I were to have a beam and I wanted to apply, let's say, 200 kilonewtons to the beam, I can't just go from 0 to 100. 
it actually would not converge, it would create a lot of problems. So typically what happens is we go in smaller steps. Let's say we go from zero to one, one to two, two to three, and then we work our way up to that 100 kilonewtons. That's all defined in this incrementation tab. So Avacus has two types, automatic or fixed. We are going to keep it as automatic. And what that basically means is that if Avacus goes 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, and there's no problems, then Avacus might get bold and say, okay, well, instead of just going uh, up by 1, I'm going to try going up by 2. And then if it works, then it might try and go up by 3. And this also works the other way. So let's say it tries to go up by 1, but there's no convergence. Well, then Abacus might decide to go up by a half and stuff like that. So it's just trying to get to the solution. Uh, maximum number of increments, I usually just put this as 10,000, something like that. It's one of those things that you would expect your analysis to work uh, before it reaches that 10,000 mark. If it doesn't, then typically you have to try and fix something. Because if you're going over 10,000 increments, it's going to be a pretty slow analysis, and you don't really want that. Uh, increment size, so this is going to be its initial attempt. And what's important to note is these are all in reference to this time period. So the time period is 1. So the actual percentage of load going to be applied is going to be this increment divided by the time period. So let's ask you guys a question. If my time period is 1, and my initial increment is also 1, and I want it, and let's say I'm applying 100 kilonewtons. In my first increment, what is Abacus going to try and apply? One kilonewton or 100 kilonewtons? What do you think? If my time period is one, and my initial increment is one, how much load is Abacus going to try and apply if I'm going for 100 kilonewtons? It's a hard question. It's one of those ones that no one knows, but yeah, Ryan is 100% correct. It is 100. So basically what you do is you take your increments or percentage of load applied is equal to increment divided by time. So I, I threw it in the chat. Percentage of the load applied is going to be your increment divided by time. If we're applying one, and our time period is 1, that means that we are going for the 100% of the load. So typically what I do is I set the initial increment, in this case I'd put it as maybe 0 0.1 or 10% of the load. Uh, it can go up to a maximum of 1, and this is going to be a minimum. So this kind of protects you in case your analysis is really, really slow. Basically what will happen is if the increments get that small, then Abacus is just going to stop the analysis and say, you know what, it, it's going too slow. You can set this as a lot smaller, but uh, usually the default is fine. So we are just going to go OK. And as we can see in our model tree, we have this uh, steps defined. So our initial step, which basically just takes into account all the boundary conditions. And then after that, it's going to start applying the load to our beam. But notice that at this particular case, or uh, the point in time, we don't have any boundary conditions and we don't have any loads on our beam. So if we were to go to the step tab to the next one, we have interaction. Now interaction is something that we are not going to talk about uh, right now. If we have time, uh, maybe towards the end of the lecture, we will do interaction. But this is basically if you have two pieces or two parts that make contact with each other. Or if you have one part and it has certain restrictions. Uh, it's hard to describe those re restrictions, so we are just going to leave it as such. Uh, one common example might be if I want to treat this whole uh, bottom edge of my beam as rigid, but the rest is deformable. So that would be one of the restrictions. We actually call those uh, constraints. Uh, since we have no contact, we can kind of skip interaction and go into load. Now load has basically two buttons. We have create a load and below it we have create boundary condition. So this is when we are going to define everything. So let's start off by saying, okay, I want this part over here on the left hand side to be fixed. So this is when I would go create a boundary condition and it's going to ask you what step this applies in. So if you have boundary conditions that are constant throughout your analysis, you're always going to want to throw them into the initial step right here. And let's just say that we have a fixed end for the name. 
Now there's a couple different ones that we can do. Uh, this first one, the symmetry, we are going to kind of leave that. We are going to go displacement and rotation because again, I want to restrict those. I'm going to go continue. It's going to say select the regions for the boundary condition. So I'm going to select this edge right here. As we can see, it's now highlighted. I go done. And then it's going to say, what do you want to restrict? So we have the displacement in the horizontal direction. We have the displacement in the vertical direction. And then we have basically the rotation. So question for you guys in chat, which boxes would I check? One, two, three, or all three, or just two of them? Which ones do you think I would check if I wanted a fixed end? If I wanted a fixed end, which boxes? There's a trick to this one. So Ryan says all three. The correct answer is actually just the first two. As we saw in the formulations, when we're using these solid elements, and this is why I did that very rushed, bare bones, uh, finite element method theory, is for these solid elements, they actually don't have a rotational degree of freedom. So you can check it if you want, but Abacus will just give you a warning saying, hey, you don't need to do this. And actually what we'll do is we'll leave it on and I'll show you where this warning actually appears. So uh, theoretically, we don't need this at all, but we're going to leave it on and show you where the error appears. So after you go continue, as we can see, we now have a boundary condition defined on this side. The other thing we wanted to do is we said we wanted to put a pressure on the top of the beam right here. So what we are going to do is we're going to go create load. It's going to say, what do you want your load to be? Well, let's call it pressure. And then what step do you want it to be? So our initial step again is related to boundary conditions. So we can't put it in the initial step, but we can put it in our apply pressure step. And then this is where you have many, many different types of things you can do. Concentrated force, moment, pressure, surface traction, body force, gravity load, a bunch of different ones. So we're just going to put it as a pressure mechanical. We're going to go continue. And what we are going to do is we are going to apply it to the top of our beam right here. So I'm going to go done. And then it's going to ask you for the magnitude of the pressure. So if we have everything in Newtons, MPA, and millimeters, uh, this right here will be in terms of MPA. So let's say that we want to apply 100 MPA to the top of our beam. We're going to go continue. And as we can see, we now have that pressure defined. So if we were to look at our model now, we have a beam. We have material properties inside of this beam. We have its boundary condition on the left-hand side defined. We have its load defined. Question for you guys in the chat. Do you think we are good to go? And if you don't think we're good to go, what, what could we possibly be missing? What do you think? Who thinks we're good to go? No one? <laughs> no one wants to talk? I know these are hard questions because it's your, well, I'm assuming it's your first real time. The thing that we are still missing is the actual elements. The whole name is the finite element method. And what I discussed yesterday was instead of calculating the displacement at every point in our beam, we actually only calculate it at nodes. And we said that if we had a beam, we had split it into a bunch of, let's say, rectangles. And at the corners of the rectangles, those are where we calculate the displacement. We haven't defined any of those elements or nodes yet. And if we were to look at our module tab, the thing after load would be mesh. So this is where you actually get into more of the finite element theory on how do you segregate your model to account for uh, different types of things. So if we were to look at the model right now, it actually doesn't have a mesh. I'm going to go to the part we have our beam. But in order to do that, you can just go uh, seed part, which basically specifies the size. So we're going to go seed part. And if I were to keep it as 100, so this would be 100 millimeters and go apply. And I just go OK. And the button below it is mesh the parts. As we can see, it starts to try to automatically generate a rectangular mesh for this part. Now, we talked about the limitations of these rectangular elements. So I'm going to ask you guys, do you think that this would be a good mesh? What do you think? Would this be considered a good mesh? 
Probably not. Yeah. And in, in actuality, this would probably not be a good mesh. One of the reasons, well, actually, there's a couple of reasons, is one of them, though, we know our beam is bending. So we know that our stresses are going to go from tensile at the top to compression at the bottom if it's cantilevered. So we need to actually have enough elements to model that distribution of strain that's going to happen throughout our beam. Another thing that I mentioned towards the end, and I, I did this pretty poorly actually, is the idea that we don't want our, our elements to be distorted. We want them to try and be as rectangular as possible. As I said in the lecture, what Abacus does is it takes one of these distorted elements, let's say this one right here, and it converts it into a different kind of domain, I'd say is the best word, where it is perfectly rectangular, it does all the calculations, and then it brings it back into this domain. And what I said is, if we have a rectangular element, that process is actually exact. The problem is, is if we don't have a rectangular element, like we don't down here, what actually happens is there's going to be some error in the model. So the more distorted elements you have, the more error there's going to be. So there's a couple different ways to avoid this, but perhaps the simplest is just to say, you know what, these elements, they're a bit too big. I want smaller element size. So what you're going to do is you're going to go back to this C part. You're going to say, well, you know what, 100 is a little bit too big. Let's go down to 50. So if I were to go OK, the first thing you're going to get, which is off screen, is going to be a warning basically saying you already have a bunch of elements. If you're going to do this, you're going to delete them. And yes, that's okay, we can delete it. We have our new seed, so if we were to mesh it again, as we can see, the elements are much smaller. Now notice that the level of distortion is much better. We still have some distorted elements, but basically here is one of the key ideas for the finite element method is the smaller the distortion, so before it was distorted on the whole side of the beam. Now the distortion is mainly just in a little part of the beam. This basically means that only this part of the beam is going to have that error. And since the uh, number of elements is small, you would expect that the error would also be smaller as well. So typically what we do as designers is we play around with this mesh. And uh, it'll be very easy to see if your mesh is good or not because of uh, what we call a convergence analysis. So what we will do, and actually we'll do it right now together, is we are going to apply our load and we are going to measure the displacement at this end of the beam. Because what we can do is we can jot it down, let's say it's 20 millimeters, and then we can redo our mesh, make it smaller, and if our new displacement is, let's say, 20.1 millimeters, so there isn't really a change, well, then we know this mesh is good. If we were to apply our displacement a second time and our displacement is like 40 millimeters, where it goes up by a factor of two, well, that usually means you, you still need to keep adjusting your mesh, if that makes sense. Now, one of the nice things is, is these elements, as we talked about in class, they are actually what take into account our finite element formulations. So this would include things like plane stress or strain, and it would include things like what kind of approximation function are you using. Remember, we said that the finite element method in general is just different approximation functions that we would use in our virtual work method. And in order to check, what we do is we go to this button right here, S4R, which basically is assigning our element types. So if I were to click it, this is where we get into all those fun things. So in the family tree over here, if I were to scroll down, by default, Abacus has plain stress defined. If we wanted plain strain, all we would have to do is click plain strain. We are going to keep it as plain stress though. And then the next one over to the, on the side here is geometric order. We said that one of the things that we can do is we can increase the number of nodes on our elements, which basically results in a larger displacement function. And we looked at two types, linear and quadratic. So if I wanted a quadratic element, I can go over to the quadratic side. If I want a linear element, I can just stick with linear. And then the last thing is going to be this idea of reduced integration. Uh, this is nice, but you have to be careful with it. It's something that we didn't talk about, but if you go into the lecture slides uh, on E-Class, I, I talk about it in the concept of isoparametric elements. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what it is kind of visually. So we are going to keep it as linear and we are going to keep this reduced integration. Actually, we'll, we'll keep it off, but I'll show you what it means. So I'm going to go OK. And what I'm going to do is uh, let's see if I can just change the view. I think it's under graphics options. No, it's not view part display options. Oh, this is way so mesh. Uh, I'm going to show you the node and element labels. So as we can see, if we were to look here, we have element 34 and it has four nodes, one on each corner here, right here. And as I said, in this finite element method, what we do is we calculate the displacement of each of these four nodes. And then we can use our approximation function to find the displacement inside of this element. So that's full integration. What reduced integration is, is saying, well, if I want a quicker analysis, rather than calculating at these four nodes, what I can do is I can just calculate it at one point. So instead of calculating four points, I can just calculate it at this point right here uh, for the stiffness matrix. So as we know, uh, if we were to go from four points to three point or one point, the accuracy is going to be reduced, but it leads to a quicker analysis. So it's kind of one of those trade-offs you have to make as a designer. Uh, typically, I, I don't put it on, but there are certain situations where it's actually extremely uh, useful to do. So we are going to just leave it as off right here. As we can see, uh, the, the orangey color, that's going to be our elements. And then uh, the purple color is our nodes. Or is that kind of pink? I'm, I'm not too sure. Now, one thing uh, to note is if you are using the student version, which I assume most of you are, uh, you are limited to the number of nodes you can have. So I've seen a lot of students get that error where it's, I think it's a thousand nodes. So if that's the case, then you just have to go back. You have to reseed your part and you basically have to use a larger mesh size because the student uh, edition restricts that. If you wanted the actual academic version, uh, let's be honest, you don't. The reason why is it's incredibly expensive and even U of A only has, I think, 20 licenses. Uh, I'm on it right now and four people are using it, but we only have 20 licenses because Abacus is, <laughs> it's that expensive. Now, the nice thing is, is now that I've defined my mesh, I can go down and I can actually run my simulation. I have everything defined, material properties, geometry, we had our loads, boundary conditions, and then our last one was our mesh. So what I do is I go down to job over here, or I can go into the module tree and go job. And basically you can create a new job. And job is the equivalent to saying analysis, create an analysis. So what we can do is we can just call this analysis one, something like that. We go continue. Uh, I don't recommend playing around with any of these. You not only have to know what your analysis is doing, but you have to know the hardware limitations of your computer. So we are just going to go OK. And if we were to expand our job tree down here, we have analysis one. So again, we didn't have to do anything. We just kept it all default. And in order to actually run the analysis, we right click it and then go submit. So after you do this, everything is actually good to go. Abacus is going to start running. So we are going to do that. And as we are going to see, Abacus is actually going to have kind of two different parts. The first one is it's going to say submitted, as we can see in brackets. And this is basically what it's doing is it's taking everything that you defined and it's creating basically a text file. This text file will contain all of the geometry, all of the material properties. And then once it has that text file, it's going to put it into the actual solver. So once you see running, that means that the text file has been created and now it's putting it into the solver. As we can see, it aborted right away, which means that we have a problem with our model. So in order to try and see which problem we have, we just go to monitor. And Abacus will, act, this is a bit big, Abacus will tell us what happened. So first of all, I want to look at is going to be these increments. Remember, we are trying to go to 100%. Our first increment of 10%, it was good. As we can see, attempt one was good. Whenever you see U, that means the next attempt was unsuccessful. So we went from 10% and then Abacus tried to apply another 10%, but uh, it was unsuccessful. So what Abacus did is instead of applying uh, 10%, it went down to 2.5%. 
As we can see, this was successful. Then it tried 3.75%. This was successful. It tried 5.6%. This was unsuccessful. So these are the attempts it's trying, and this is the total time. So by this increment right here, we were at 16.5 or 25% of our final load. If we were to look at the error, it says that the time increment is less than the minimum specified. So if you remember, our smallest time increment we had was one to the negative five. And if I were to scroll down here, we hit that time increment and we stopped. Now, question for you guys in the chat. Do you think that our model has a big problem? What do you think? Do you think that this analysis is bad? A bad analysis? What do you guys think? Random guess. I'm not expecting correct answer. David says no, and you are correct. The thing is, is in Abacus, I could apply whatever load I want. If I wanted to, I could apply a million MPA. A million MPA. We know physically that that would never happen. Our material would explode. But Abacus doesn't know that. So what happens is, is if you were to apply a load that's perhaps way larger than the actual capacity of your beam, well then it's, it's obviously never going to work. Even if I were to specify a very small minimum time increment, it will still never work. Now the nice thing is, is we can actually check our results and that's what we are going to do next. So as we can see, we failed at 18.1% uh, or this would be 18.1 MPA. And if we were to go to warnings, the one thing that I want to, to show you really quick, uh, this is basically meaning uh, system matrix negative eigenvalues. It means that our system is becoming unstable. But the first thing I want to do is this one right here. As I told you, if we were to specify a rotational degree of freedom, uh, it doesn't make sense in the formulations. And Abacus actually accounts for that using one of these errors and saying, hey, you don't need to do that. But you don't really have to pay attention to the warnings too much. Uh, warnings, your everything will start or everything will still run. It's errors that will actually stop the analysis. So our analysis has aborted. But the nice thing is, is Abacus has saved all of the information of all of those increments. So in order to view it, we can right click it, and instead of going monitor, we can go results. So if I were to click results, we now have our beam, and this is it's in in the initial unformed configuration. But if we were to go to this colorful plot right here, we can actually see the deflection of this beam. This is how you get those nice pretty pictures that I told you about. And if we were to look at the top corner here, we can actually look at a bunch of different things. So by default, the thing Abacus will show you is going to be S, which is stress, and then Mises, so the von Mises stress. So this is our actual von Mises stress distribution throughout our beam. What we can do is we can look at other things. So this right here, these E's, E is basically strain. So LE would be our linear strains, and then PE, or these are actually technically our logarithmic strains, and then PE is our plastic strains. So plastic strains occur when we actually have that yielding. As we can see in our beam here, all the yielding seems to be occurring at the left-hand side. We don't really have any yielding on the right-hand side. If I were to actually look at the stress distribution, we have a lot of stress around those two edges again because they are fixed. So this is when it's nice to look at the analysis because we can look at a bunch of different things. Uh, U, this is our displacement in our beam, so we can check both the horizontal as well as the vertical directions. We can look at different types of stress. So we have in-plane principle, we have the Tresca stress, we have the minimum principle strains, all those fun things that we talked about in our lecture. So it's absolutely fantastic what you can do. You can look at actual components, S11, S22 through 3, uh, 1, 2. Uh, question for you guys, if we assumed 3, 3, or sorry, if we assumed plane stress, we know that S33 should be equal to 0, but we know that the, the strain in that direction wouldn't be equal to 0. So I can go to pl uh, logarithmic strains, 3, 3. Uh, it's actually equal to 0 in this case. So yeah. That's the fun part. So I actually finished a little bit early, 
But that's great because now we can start playing around with uh, some things. So the first thing I actually want to do is I want to go back and I'm going to go to my model. Actually, let's put it this way. It, does anyone have any questions before we start playing around and getting a little bit goofy? Anyone? No questions? If you have questions, just throw them out in chat. It's, it's uh, I, I love answering them. This is my, my passion, so this is a lot of fun for me. That's why I think it's going to be fun to get a little bit goofy. Now, the reason why our model failed, basically, is because we have that plasticity. Plasticity will cause yielding, but it also will cause convergence issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to delete plasticity. I'm going to go OK, and I'm going to rerun the model. So I can do that by just right-clicking, going Submit. It says you already have an analysis. Do you want to overwrite it? Yes, I do. So we are going to run it now and just see what happens. So we're going to monitor it. Oops, I don't want the results I wanted to monitor. So what you can do is you can actually watch your analysis run. And this is a great way to waste your life, basically. So if I'm running an analysis, what you should do is you should run it and just leave it, go play a game or something, go out for lunch. But I like to actually watch it and see where the problems are occurring. Now, in this case, as we can see, our analysis completed, right? So it's actually looking pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to monitor or look at our results now. And as we can see, it was now able to take that full 100 MPA load. Now, what's nice is I'm going to look at my deflection, U, and I'm going to look at my vertical deflection. At this end right here, it is displaced by around 30 millimeters, as we can see. 30.049 times 10 to the 1, so 30 millimeters here. Let's have a little bit of fun, and let's say that we have a surface right here. Well, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my load. Let's go to our load. Let's put our 250 MPA. So we know that this is going to displace at least uh, 30 millimeters. Let's put a floor below this beam. And on this floor, let's define some sort of contact between them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a part. Uh, it's going to be the same process as before. We'll call this a floor, 2D deformable. We'll go continue. And I'll just make it a rectangle. So let's say that the floor has uh, a width of 1500. And it has, oh, actually, this is the first point. So 0, 0, 1500. And how thick should we make the floor? 500? something like this. So again, it's just going to be a rectangle. Let's say that our floor was made of complete steel. So what I would do is I'd go into the property tab and I would apply uh, steel to this basically. I select it. I use my beam section like I would before, but now in my property tab, or sorry, my assembly tab, I can actually import this floor part. So I'm going to go OK. And what we are going to do is we are going to apply or place this basically just below our beam. So what we would do is we can go to this right here, translate instance. So I'm going to click that. I'm going to click our floor, continue. It's going to say which point or what do you want to move as a reference point. Let's just take this point and we'll put it at 0 comma negative 10. So right below the origin, we are going to go OK. So as we can see, we have our beam, but now we have this kind of floor structure below it. So from here, we're going to actually have to go uh, define some boundary conditions for this right here. We still have our original ones, but what we should do is we are going to, uh, where is it? Create a boundary condition. Let's do one for the floor. And since it's static, we are going to go initial, displacement. And let's say that we are going to take all three of these edges and we are going to fix them. So again, we don't need that actual rotational degree of freedom. We'll go OK. And now what we can do in Abacus is we can actually define the contact between these two structures. But question for you guys, if I don't define the contact, what's going to happen? Do you think my analysis will run if I don't define any contact? Do you think it'll run? Do you think there will be convergence issues? What do you think? Am, am I good to go? Or will this create a big problem if I don't define any contact? No one knows. That's okay. 
the, the best thing about a model is you just keep rerunning it and see what happens. So let's submit the analysis. Oh, I forgot to mesh it. So this is one thing that a lot of students forget, I forget too, is we didn't define the mesh for this beam. So we go to the mesh tab. Under parts, we have to go from, our beam has a mesh, but our floor doesn't. So we are just going to seed it. And let's put it as, uh, yeah, 150. Yeah, we'll apply 150. Oh, that's a, that's a bit much. Uh, let's just go 100. So uh, we're just going to mesh it. We now have a mesh. Now we can submit the analysis. So let's see what happens. Let's see if there's going to be a convergence issue or not. Again, just going to monitor it, see what happens. So it's submitted. It started the actual analysis where it's creating everything. It has a warning sign, two dimensional models, errors, it has a log. The data file, so this is what you would look at if you want everything in detail. But as we can see, the analysis actually already completed. So I'm going to right click it, I'm going to go monitor, or results. And if we were to see what happens, again, uh, as Ryan predicted, it's going to pass right through it, but there's no convergence issues. What basically happens is this beam will have no deformation because there's no loads applied to it. And then this beam will still deform as usual and it will just go right through, basically, because there's no contact. So what we can do to define contact is we go into that interaction tab that we have before, or that I kind of mentioned before. Now there's going to be a couple of things that you want to do. The first one is you need to create the, uh, I'm not sure where it is, I usually use the buttons on the side here. So which one would it be? I guess I, I could probably create it just right through here. So create an interaction. And what we'll do is we'll do a surface to surface contact. We'll have it in the uh, initial phase and we'll just call this contact. So surface to surface. So as you're going to guess, all you need to do is actually define two surfaces. So we're going to go continue. It's going to say select the master surface. Now, typically the master surface is the stiffer surface. Since these are both the same materials, it doesn't matter too much. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it as the smaller mesh surface. Would that make sense? Slave nodes can't penetrate it. We'll see what happens. So we'll select this surface. The slave one, we'll put it as here. So again, typically the master surface is the one uh, that that is stiffer. And then it should be the one with the, the thick, uh, coarser elements. So it technically should be reversed, but it'll be fine. And from here, all you need to do is define either finite, el or finite sliding or small sliding. And then the other thing is going to be uh, the interaction properties. So this was actually the button I was looking for. Uh, as we can see, it's actually right here. I just missed it. But we can actually create it from this tab. So create an interaction property. So we'll just call this contact property. It's going to be a contact. We're going to go continue. And then from here, it's very similar to the material menu where you can create materials where you have a bunch of drop down lists. So we have a tangential behavior, which is basically friction. So if we want to, we can actually specify a friction coefficient, maybe 0 0.1, something like that. And then the, we can also define the normal behavior. So we'll just keep it as hard contact. We, we won't change anything. Uh, we can include some sort of cohesion cohesion. So if like we have a glue, we can actually uh, make it stick, which is pretty cool. And then also geometric properties. So if you have uh, 2D models that have that thickness into the page, you're going to actually have to specify a geometric thickness. And I think we had it as 200. So this thickness right here, we'll leave it as that for now, should be the same as our beam section profile. So if we look in here, our plane stress strain thickness was 200 those should be the exact same. So if we were to go back to our actual interaction tab, we now have these kind of squares, meaning that interaction is now defined between these two models. So we can save it and we can run it and see what happens. Contact is usually the hardest thing to run. It'll lead to the most convergence issues uh, compared to plasticity, at least from what I've seen. 
So you got to be very careful with contact. Uh, one of the things that you have to be careful with is how fast you ram those surfaces together. So one of the things I'm almost expecting is it's going to go right through our object uh, depending on our initial increment. Usually you have to apply the load very, very slowly in order to, for the contact to be achieved properly. So let's check our results here and let's see what happened. Oh, so the contact actually worked. So now we can see that the beam has stopped. The contact is starting to be initiated into our other beam. And yeah, you can look at contact forces, all that fun stuff. So this is the beautiful part about the finite element method is you can do basically whatever you want. Uh, let's try and play around with it a bit. Let's put in just a giant pressure. A thousand MPA or one mega. I'm not too sure. <laughs> GPA, I guess. Let's see what happens. Well, uh, this is basically the end. Uh, question for you guys, of course, is what, what do you think? What questions do you have? Is there anything you're curious about? Once you start applying big forces, it takes a while to run. Okay, that was pretty good. <clears throat> so check the results. As we can see, a lot more pressure goes through. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. So yeah, that's basically Abacus in a nutshell. Any, any questions at all? Questions, concerns? Yeah, I, I love it because I can simulate anything I can imagine. And now you have that power as well. So use it wisely. No? No questions or concerns? That's okay. Uh, so that's it for this lecture, guys. Thank you all for showing up. If you guys have any uh, questions, you can feel free to email me. Anything like that, I'm happy to answer. Uh, I'm going to start working on those final exam reviews, so expect those to be out in the coming days. And other than that, uh, that's it. Thank you so much for uh, an amazing semester. And I look forward to seeing many of you next year in, uh, or I guess next semester in 374. So yeah, thank you all and have a wonderful day. I'll stick around if you guys have any questions. No problem, Ryan. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for showing up. No problem, guys. Have a great day. You're welcome, David. Nice, nice of you guys to show up. I, I was scared that no one would show up today. <laughs> but uh, you guys made my day. <laughs>